mean, they really hate him. DC is overwhelmingly, the, the city of where I live and have lived most of my life, they're, you know, it's an overwhelmingly, what is it? Harold, 94% for Hillary, something like that. Yeah. Every Prius on my street has an Obama sticker on it, okay? <laughs> I'm so, I mean, they come that way from the factory, but they haven't taken them off. Them off. But even, the, and so of course they hate Trump because they're like, wow, who is this guy? The Republicans hate him more. Idi Amin would get a warmer welcome in our dog park, okay, than Donald Trump would, were he to venture into Northwest DC, which being wise, he will not. And the reasons are obvious. He's a threat not just to their vision of the country, but to the sinecures they hold to the sort of high wage, low work jobs, to the inside deal that they have. The drain the swamp stuff, they hated that above all. And it was a huge part of the reason Trump won. I mean, DC, you know how you know DC is corrupt? Because it's a great city to live in. I'm serious. We're the richest city in America. And that's obvious, why wouldn't we be? We make innovative products, the world wants to buy, oh wait, no, sorry. I got us confused with the real city. No, we're the richest city because government spends more than it ever has and we take the VIG. Some of it sticks to us and then we distribute it to our friends. It's the definition of corruption. We have full employment. Have you wandered around? There's a construction crane in every corner. All the kids are happy. It's like Lake Wobegon. Everybody's impressive. Everyone's in a great mood. I've never been to lunch here that lasted less than two hours and I've never paid. That's what it's like. And that's, by the way, I mean, I. I'm not attacking it, I love it. I'm never leaving, why would I? And I recommend to all of you that you move here immediately, because it's great. But why wouldn't the rest of the country, a country in which the middle class is literally dying, dying, that's real. I'm not a left winger, by the way. I know I sound like some French philosopher, but I'm not a left winger. I've always been a right winger, but that's what the data show. And by the way, have you been there? It's true. And so why wouldn't the rest of the country look on at this and say, that's, like, that's disgusting. The people may be nice, but this is unfair. This is wrong. That's the lesson that the Republican Party should have learned from this. And, and really learned it. Not just mouth the bumper stickers, repeat the talking points, but like thought about it a little bit. Or deeply, actually. As you do when tragedy occurs. Instead, they decided that it's all about Trump. Now, if I can just say, in the interest of being totally fair, Trump thinks it's all about Trump too. That's just, that's true, sorry. He does, he thinks everything's about him and if you were to ask Trump, like, why did you get elected? He would say, you know, I'm a great guy. I spent a year and a half on the road covering this, totally changed my politics, totally changed my view of America, just getting out there as traveling places and talking to people always does change you, which is why you should do it. But in that year and a half, I never met a single person who said, I'm voting for Trump because just the kind of guy I want to babysit my kids. You know what I mean? Or like, I'm leaving for the weekend, I want him to stay with my wife and balance my checkbook while I'm gone. Like, he, that's, that's him. I never met one person who said, you know, I was kind of on the fence about Trump until I saw that Access Hollywood tape. And then I thought, he's speaking to me. <laughs> Not one person said anything like that. And I met... Thousands of people were voting for Trump. I called the election early because I just met so, I mean, because I kind of could see what this was about. It was never about him. It was about what he represented. It was about what he was saying. Actually, in some ways, it was about the issues, too. He was bringing up issues that nobody ever talked about in D.C. Immigration and trade. And by the way, I'm not taking a position on either one. I'm just telling you that in Washington, we never debated either issue, ever. Not one time. I've never heard anybody mention those issues. Why? Because we don't debate things. That's all we do is debate things. We debate things that the law of the sea treaty is like a huge debate here. I'm not even sure what it is. And we debate it. But no one ever d debates immigration and trade, which is a little weird because they're big issues. Immigration determines who comes into your country, who lives next door to you, who chooses your president. That's not a small thing. Trade determines wealth generation. These are big issues. Why were they never debated? Because nobody disagreed on them, that's why. There was a bipartisan consensus that both were good, but there was no downside to either one, and more of them was always better. And like we should have realized that was untrue because that's, that's never true. Nothing is all good, by the way. 
There's not one thing in the world that's all good. Everything is a mixed blessing. By the way, if you wake up one morning and something is all good, there's no downside, you are dead. You have gone to a better place. But in this temporal world, the best you can do is finding something that's you know, more good than bad. And you hope to go with that rather than the reverse. But that's as good as you're going to get. But in those two issues, we here in Washington told the rest of the country they're great. And they're only great for us, which is definitely true. Everyone here is richer and has more housekeepers than ever before. But they're good for all of you. It's all good for everybody. That was a lie. We oversold. It doesn't mean trade is bad. It doesn't mean immigration is bad. I'm for trade and I'm for immigration for whatever it's worth. But the idea that no one gets hurt by our policies is insane. It's dishonest. And people finally started to figure it out. And moreover, they started to figure out that it was a racket. Because whenever you raised your hand to say something about it, nobody addressed your concerns on these and so many other issues. Nobody took you seriously. You're attacked. So if you live in the middle of the country and you say, look, I'm for immigrants. Like by the way, just to be totally clear, Americans like immigrants. We have the highest number of foreign-born people in our country than we've ever had, than any country has ever taken in voluntarily in the history of the world, ever. And there aren't riots. People like immigrants. Why wouldn't they? They're great. They work super hard. They're nice. My business partner's an immigrant, a lot of really smart immigrants. So people are for immigrants. The question is how many, what kind, and what effects do they have? Those are the real questions. So if you raise your hand and say, look, I like immigrants. They're awesome. They work super hard. But like the town I live in, pick one. Youngstown, Mahoning Valley, Ohio. You know, it was a former industrial center now, high unemployment rate. And if you say, look, I work in the service industry. My dad worked at a Delco plant. I make less than my father did. That's a problem. Explain to me, Mr. Economist in Washington, why if you let in tons of low wage immigrants, it doesn't depress the value of work. It doesn't lower my wages. They used to call it supply and demand. I don't know how many of you all went to Harvard Business School, but that's actually, they teach that there, supply and demand. It's the iron law of economics. The more you have of something, the lower its value drops. That's why sand is cheap. So if you have a ton of people willing to work for less, what happens to wages? Do they go up? No, they go down. It's just a really obvious point. It's, it's physics, actually. It's not even economics. It's true, period. It's always true. And so if you raise your hand and say, I don't dislike immigrants, but why is this good for me? I, I, you know, I've got a job at Walmart, and I, I kind of like to have a job making more. What did people in D.C. say to you on both sides, Republican and Democrat? Did they say, you know, that's a, really, that's a totally fair point. Let me explain why it's a good thing anyway. Even though you may be getting shafted, and you kind of are, it's worth it. That's a fair response. No. The response was, shut up, bigot. You just don't like them because they're different from you. What? No, I like them. Shut up, racist. You're a xenophobe. Call you names. So it's a really obvious question. What happens when you tell people that their sincere, fact-based, economics-based concerns are actually a sign that they're going to hell? That they're immoral? That they have no right to express themselves because they're just so disgusting? Does it clear up those concerns? They say, oh, I'm Hitler? Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm going back to Walmart. I'm psyched now. Thank you. No. Those concerns go subterranean where they fester and they emerge in the form of, wait for it, Donald Trump. Or by the way, Bernie Sanders or Marine Le Pen in France or Brexit in Great Britain. It's the same thing going on around the world. A small number of people have a pretty good deal. They've made a bunch of decisions that really overall kind of help them. And they refuse to entertain dissent, different points of view from the people they're supposed to be watching over and protecting, representing. And instead, they attack those people because, honestly, they have contempt for those people. What happens when you have a system like that? Well, you have a revolution, actually. That's what you have. And that's what we just had. And luckily, it was a peaceful revolution so far. But that's exactly what it was. Nobody wanted to elect Donald Trump president. I don't think he wanted to be president, actually. He was just kind of trying to prove a point. But he was basically drafted by a frustrated middle class and put into this position. So here's the, I'll stop on this and take your hostile questions, but here's my point. <laughs> How do you stop this cycle from continuing? 
And I'll just be totally blunt, because why not? I like Trump, as I said a minute ago, and I think a lot of what Trump says is true. But I think it's been pretty tough for him to govern. I mean, very tough for him to govern. It's very complex, the exec three million people in the executive branch. And like maybe 50 of them don't hate him. Iman uh, imagine trying to run a company with three million people who are seeking your destruction. Like there aren't enough hours in the day. It it's a hard job. And his opponents, I think, have demeaned and debased themselves and are, are actually rooting against the success of the administration, which is not a place you want to be. No matter how much you dislike someone or, or disagree with them, you don't want to be rooting for the failure of the presidency. It's bad for the country. So we're in a tough spot. How do you keep this from continuing? From this moment, how do you prevent this moment from becoming a cycle? Because by the way, if you think Trump is like a departure from the norm, and you think this is all pretty exciting, wait till you see President Sharpton, because that's going to be wild, okay? <laughs> Because you can kind of see how things could accelerate from here. If you look at DOT stats, Department of Transportation fatality statistics, you will find that in rural areas with soft shoulders by the side of the road, the majority of automobile deaths take place when the car strikes an immovable object on the other side of the road. Why is that? Overcorrection every time. Hit something soft, bam, tree, death. So overcorrection is always your biggest fear. Maybe great now, but you can kind of see where this is going. So how do you stop this? It's really simple. It's not hard. You don't need any specific program to do it. You just have to remember that it's a democracy. And in a democracy, the people get to rule. It doesn't mean that any group of angry people has, gets to take control or that you have to, if you're a legislator, do exactly what your constituents want all the time. I mean, you're hired to make wise decisions. I get it. You're a mediating force. But generally, if the population of your country in a democracy has a problem, you have to listen to it. If they have an idea, you have to entertain it. If they have an anxiety, you have to try to assuage it. You have to respond to people. The second you think they are beneath your attention or they're so dumb and evil, and by the way, physically unattractive. You don't have to spend a moment of your day worrying about them. Things will get absolutely crazy because democracy is the pressure relief valve in this country. That's why it's been a stable, happy country for 240 years. Because unlike other countries, our children, as children, are taught, if you're frustrated, don't freak out, don't torch the police station, don't loot Walmart, calm down, vote. And you can change the system. If enough of you get together, you can change the system. If people start to believe that that's not true, that it's all rigged, it's nonsense, and like 25 people in the capital city are making all the decisions for their own benefit and you have no voice, that's when people start to get radical and they start to do things they wouldn't think they would do and that aren't good long term. So nothing will calm down in D.C. until both parties think through what happened and respond. So with that, I'll take your questions. Thanks for enduring me. That's such a smart question. Not surprisingly, Harold Schaeber, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and the question was, in case you couldn't hear it, how does this compare to the Tea Party? And what does this become? The Tea Party was this potent political force for a moment, and then it seemed to kind of go away. Will the same be true of what we're seeing in this moment, if that's a fair representation? And here's what's similar about the Tea Party and the Trump movement, if both of them were to a large extent, much more than the average person in the media understood. And by the way, the media are not just liberal, obviously, but they're dumb. If I can say, if, if you're, I mean, let's be real, if you're graduating at the, you know, in the top of your class or some college, are you really going to go to the media? I don't think so. So a lot of the dumb kids are now analyzing this and <laughs> what they meant, that's, tr trust me, I work there, I know, um, not at Fox, but like in, you know, in the media. Uh, 
No, I, we have a lot of really smart people in Fox. Same cannot be said for all the networks. But okay, here's my point. I worked at all of them. Come on, I worked at, I'm not even going to name them, but I, there isn't one I haven't worked at. I've had primetime shows on all of them, so I have some sense. But uh, anyway, here's the point. Both those movements were reactions against, heavily, against the Republican Party. The conservatives are mad at the Republican Party, and why wouldn't they be? So for like the last five election cycles, they tell their voters, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. For the last four, they said, we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare the second we can. Vote for us. And so these voters have been dutifully, you know, a lot of people are upset about Obamacare. It's never gotten 50% approval in the country, not one time. So the majority of the country, slim majority, but still a majority, doesn't like it. And the Republicans have said, we're the party that's going to undo that. So now they have control of everything. Presumably they could do it tomorrow. And they still haven't done it because actually they didn't spend any time thinking about what to replace it with. I mean, it's just true. And so if this thing goes on long enough and you're a Republican voter, after a while you're thinking to yourself, I hate these people. I'm not going to vote for the Democrats because Nancy Pelosi terrifies me, but are they really so much better? That's how a lot of Republicans feel, a lot. That's how a lot of Trump voters feel. So the Tea Party dissipated because it didn't have a leader. And, you know, leaderless parties are like bees. They sting once and then they die. This party has a leader, but he's not an ideologue. It's interesting. So Trump has done this amazing thing. I mean, he, he won the Republican nomination with no staff, no pollsters, no campaign manager. He just kind of, he and his daughter and their iPhone kind of did it. Raised no money. I mean, it really was a one-man deal. This is amazing. Nothing like that's ever happened in American history. Congratulations. But what he has never done and probably never will do is articulate in an understandable way to the average person what all of this means. How, do you, how does this add up? What does Trumpism look like? And I, and I think, frankly, somebody, there clearly is something that ties all these together. The problem is that Trump is acting out of instinct and he's not, you know, an abstract thinker. He's not, even Reagan was pretty good at explaining, you know, what, what's Reaganism, you know, and Trump has not been. But I think at some point, Trumpism, it probably won't be called that, some soft form of nationalism will become what the Republican Party stands for because it's what the majority of their voters want. And what does it mean? Really simply, it means on the foreign policy questions, doesn't mean we're going to retreat from the world. Of course, we're not going to retreat from the world. We keep the shipping lanes open. We have to, you know, we run the world and we have to continue doing that. But it does mean that every decision ought to be based on one question. Is it good for America or not? I'm not going to send people, you know, you all have kids. I have kids. I'm not going to send my kids to go die for the sake of, I don't know, Latvian border integrity or whatever. I mean, come on. That's insane. We should only act if we think it makes America safer and more prosperous. That's the whole point of having a government is to protect you and to help you lead a better life. It's not to bring democracy to a place you've never been and whose language you can't speak. If that's a result of it, that's great. I mean, you know, wish the world well. But the point can't be nation building. That's insane, okay? That's the first point. On economics, this is what nobody has noted. Trump has rejected Reaganism. He's not a free market guy. The people behind Trump are very skeptical of market capitalism. And the reason they're skeptical of it is it hasn't served the middle class. We've had massive wealth generation in the past 10 years. And it has not been distributed equally. In fact, it's been distributed more unequally than any time in American history. It all went to the top 1%. Uh, trust me, I'm not a socialist. I'm just saying that that's true. And everyone lied about it. Democrats lied about it because it happened under St. Obama. And they didn't want to tarnish his halo. And Republicans lied about it because they thought that any talk of income inequality sounded like an attack on capitalism and they didn't want to attack capitalism. Okay, I get it. But at some point you have to tell the truth. This is not serving the middle class. And without a thriving independent middle class, you can't have a democracy, you can't have a market economy, your country will collapse. I mean, if you ever wonder why Latin America is a mess, not all of it, but a lot of it. The people are smart, they're cool, the food is great. I mean, every, they've got natural resources, it's great. But it's kind of a disaster, why? The main reason is they don't have a stable middle class. This has been true for centuries. And that's why we are stable and happy. 
is because the average person kind of owns his own house and, you know, is vested in the country and feels like he's not getting shafted. The second that goes away, turmoil ensues. So the Trump people, the smart ones, and there are some, look at this, whatever it is we've been doing, the way we've been structuring our economy, and they say, this is making the country more volatile. This is not sustainable. This is bad. Let's try something else. And I think most people agree. The average person is not libertarian on economics. Now, I always have been libertarian on economics my whole life. But, you know, I've lived in one of the richest zip codes in America, so, like, why wouldn't I be? Truth is, the average person does not agree with that at all. Do you know what the constituency is for pairing back entitlements, Social Security and, and Medicare? It's like nine people. And they're all in Paul Ryan's office. Like, nobody else wants to do that. No, I'm serious. I'm not attacking Paul Ryan. I'm just saying the average person has zero interest in that because they use the programs. That's why they're the most expensive because they're the most popular. Duh. This is a democracy. You have to go with what people want in the end. And the Trump people get that. That's what's, last thing I'll say, but that's what's so frustrating to me watching this. I'm not any great policy dork or whatever, but I'm kind of interested and I've certainly watched a lot of it. And so to hear Trump come out with things that Democrats have been espousing for years, Canadian drug reimportation, remember that one? Drugs are too expensive. Why don't we just buy them from Canada cheaper? And for 20 years, Republicans said, well, you can't do that for reasons that we can't explain exactly, but you can't because that's wrong. Canada is a socialist government. Yeah, okay. I'm not you know, endorsing Canada or anything, but like, that would help, right? You can't. They're unsafe. Canadian drugs are unsafe? It's not like I'm buying them from a street vendor in Tijuana. It's Canada. Like, they're fine. You can't do that. Trump comes out, and Democrats, probably correctly, have said, whoa, why can't we do this? Trump goes out, immediately, he's for it. Nobody says anything, because he's Hitler. So, like, anything he says must be wrong. Or Trump goes out and says, one thing we're not going to do, mess with entitlements. How many Republican presidents have said that? Let me just check. Oh, zero. That's never been said. It's a huge deal. Democrats have been asking for this for so long. Infrastructure. Hillary comes out and she says, well, I'm going to build, a, I'm going to spend half a trillion dollars on infrastructure. Trump goes, I'll spend a trillion. He asked on Tuesday night, Obama in 09, this is like a boring fact, but he asked, I think it was 873 billion. Trump asked for a trillion. So you'd think the Democratic Party, which is obviously the party of infrastructure, would be for that. Nope. Against it now. <laughs> they dislike him so much, they can't hear him. I know I've said that five times, but it's totally true. Something brand new is happening. Brand new. And not just because of the tweeting and the, the theatrics and the craziness. But on a deeper level, something brand new. There's a realignment happening. And everybody is missing it. It's frustrating. Ha! <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. Which people? Right. That's an, that's an interesting point of view. I mean, I guess I agree with half of it, which, you know, I've never been anti-union. Um, there's, there's an insider quality that I really don't like where politicians who take money from unions set the union wages, and I think that's, there's no defense of that. Sorry. But I definitely think the idea of people coming together to represent their own interests against those of their employers, I'm totally for that as an employee. I'm totally for that. Um, and I also think that Unions on the upside kind of care about the right things. You know, the dignity of the average person, making enough to send your kids to summer camp. That's not extravagant. That's okay. Having health care. Like, I'm for that because I'm for families, actually. What's missing in your calculation is the following question. What are all these people going to do? So, again, we have, Trump said it was 100 million people out of the labor force. You know, 
probably, well, strictly speaking, that's true, but you know, some of them are not going to be working no matter what. Over 50 million people could be working in art. That's terrible. And by the way, a disproportionate number of them are men. Male unemployment is a massive, massive problem because traditionally male jobs are going away, as you know. Thank you, self-driving cars. Soon to be self-driving fire trucks, by the way. Good luck. Um, what do you do with those people? So in order to organize labor, you have to be laboring. And I don't think enough people, in fact, nobody I know of is thinking about that. So you had an industrial economy, and so you could bring people in, and we did, and it was great to work in our factories. And we did from Eastern and Central Europe and Ireland, you know, for generations, and they made the country way better. And that's why everyone's for immigration, because we had such a successful experiment with it. With it. The problem is that our current immigration standards were designed for that kind of economy. And so the truth is we just don't have a lot of low-skilled jobs left. No manufacturing jobs of that kind, basically, but very some ag jobs, but those are going, their automations totally transformed agriculture, as you probably know. And looking forward, you can see we're going to have even fewer because of automation, robots. If you haven't gone on the internet to see the video that came out yesterday, a house was built with a 3D printer in 24 hours, you should see it. By the way, if you know anyone in the construction trades, they should be really worried. There are lots of things that are going to become automated in the next 10 years. And so the question becomes, what do people do for a living? Now, you guys are set because there's never not going to be a need for firemen, period. Okay, But if you're a truck driver, truck driving is the single most common job for high school educated men in America. Number one, self-driving cars are an obsession of people in Washington because they're so cool. They're awesome. They're just so great. How neat is that? And by the way, traffic safety will improve dramatically. Not one person I have ever heard in D.C. has raised the obvious question, which is, why are we doing this? We're doing it to save on labor costs. What will be the effect? To put out of work 8 million people like in a day. And what are those people going to do next? Write software? Probably not. What are they going to do for a living? It's a social disaster looming on the horizon that nobody here wants to deal with or cares about. And by the way, at the same time, the Obama administration set aside almost half a billion dollars to fund, and I think it's still going on, Trump people haven't stopped it, to fund the development of self-driving cars. Really? So the U.S. government is actively working to put you out of work. Then you want disability or something? It's, it's, the whole thing is horrible. So the question, the key question for this administration, for any administration, is what do people do? Because work isn't just a way to get a paycheck. It's a, it's, it confers dignity. You're proud of yourself when you work. I mean, I don't need to tell you. You do something that everyone loves, and you know it's great. You know, wherever you go, people are like, oh, I can't believe that's what you're a firefighter. That's incredible. That's got to be a huge part of your lives. Why wouldn't it be? People need that, men especially. Men go crazy if they don't have that. They do. Have you seen it? Yeah. They, they're horrible when they don't have that. And so if you have a whole country of men without that, you have major social problems. And so I just think, look, I'm, as I've said nine times, and I mean it, I'm totally for immigration. But we shouldn't import a single new person, especially at the low end, until we figure out what they're going to do. It's not, and in my neighborhood, nobody gets that because they just love having cheap servants. I'm just being honest. It's totally true. And they're like, oh, immigration, it's all upside. You know, interesting ethnic festivals, and I never have to change my sheets, and like, it's just great. They pay their household help literally less than your kid makes for a summer job, and yet they feel like they're all virtual. Like, I'm a good person because I, you know, know my housekeeper's last name. Ugh, it's the worst. The arrogance of it all. But they're not asking the core question, which is, what is the rest of the country going to do for work? And I don't know the answer. I wish I did. But I will, the last thing I'll say, if I were the Trump administration, I'd shut down the self-driving car stuff tomorrow. And I'd lie about it. I just have the Department of Transportation issued orders saying, we're not doing this because it's, I don't know, pick something dangerous. Just make it up. I mean, you know, <laughs> wouldn't be the first time something was made up in Washington. And people be like, well, it's not dangerous. It's actually, it's going to save life. No, it's dangerous. Our studies, uh, which we'll release at some point, uh, show that it's incredibly dangerous and we're not doing it. And I just shut it down. Not allowed. You didn't buy the roads. You can't put your self-driving vehicle on those roads. No. U.S. government built those roads. We get to determine who's on them, so tough. And if you don't like it, you know, go pound sand. And the reason would be you don't want to displace 8 million people without a contingency plan for what they're going to do next. 
But that's probably why I'm not in charge, because that's insane, I guess. But it's not insane, it's true. Time for one last question. Anything S sex related? Yes, sir. <laughs> I've got four kids, like I can take any question. Yep. The Republicans are screwing up my, uh, majorly, and in 18, it's going to go back. Um, both houses will swing back. Possible. I mean, I just lived through this election, so you're not going to catch me saying, that'll never happen about anything ever again. <laughs> that'll never happen. That's never, my favorite is, it's never happened before, therefore it can't happen this time. Okay, Einstein, no. go sell aluminum siding or something. You know what I mean? Like, the key quality in the predictions business is humility, um, and it's also the one in shorter supply. So look, I don't know, and you may be entirely right. I would say that increases the pressure on the Trump people to get something done while they can. So by March 1st, 2009, the Obama people, the Obama White House had four major pieces of legislation signed on the president, went through Congress, signed law. And some of them were big, the Lilly Ledbetter you know, Protection Act and the stimulus, you know, $900 million or a billion dollars. And some of them weren't, but they were still discrete achievements. This administration has gotten, let's see, I'm just kind of, I'm nothing. And a lot of their nominees haven't been confirmed. I, t I ran into a cabinet secretary the other day in the hallway, totally reasonable person. You know, how's it going? And he said, and I'm quoting, I won't have my staff in place till mid-July because they're not being confirmed. Now, on the one side, you could say, well, okay, the Democrats are being obstructionist, which they are. I mean, completely. They voted against people. Elaine Chao, people voted against, like, really? Because Elaine Chao is so scary? Or because she doesn't know what she's doing? There's no reason to do that. It's insane. But that's their position. It doesn't matter. Thanks to rule changes put into place by the Democrats, they need 51 votes. They could do all of this if they wanted. And they don't want to because they don't want to set that precedent. And I understand the Senate you know, doesn't want to bulldoze the minority. I get it. But the White House ought to be whipping this thing. And President Trump ought to be turning his Twitter machine and focusing on the leadership, the Republican leadership of the Senate and getting these things through. And they're not. And I don't think they understand. And by the way, winning presidents in their first term never quite understand how short the time is. I mean, you can ask Carol, who's watched this a lot more closely than I have for many more years. But... If you don't get it done right away, you're likely not to get it done. So look, who knows what's going to happen? We could be you know, invaded by Belgium. I mean, literally, like, anything could happen. But the one thing we know is that if they don't get it done this year, they're probably not going to. They're going to be, the last thing I'll say, people don't understand the degree to which there is a real ideological gap between the Republican leadership, especially in the House, and the White House. They just don't agree with each other at all. They really don't. And I would argue that Trump is way more in the mainstream than the Republican leadership is. Way more. In the, it, I'm not even arguing, and I know it, because you just poll his issues. If you poll any of Trump's issues, by the way, even the ones that like MSC, NBC is all upset about, pull up the Gallup poll on that question. No matter how divisive it is or controversial, I think it's the cable news term we use, controversial. One of those meaningless words makes you want to puke, but whatever. Those issues, every one of them that I'm aware of has over 50% support. Trump himself scares the hell out of people, but his ideas are mainstream. The Republican leadership is exactly the opposite. They're kind of reassuring and this is your captain speaking kind of attitudes. But their economic program is not popular at all, but they really believe it. So there is a coming clash between the White House and the Republicans on the Hill, and I'm not sure Trump's going to win. I think he should win because I think the guy who represents the most Americans should win but I'm not sure he will. Anyway, on that happy note, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it.